Our scripture reading today comes from Romans chapter 8, verse 10. Romans chapter 8, verse 10. So if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, verse 10. I think that's, yeah, 8, 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Because of righteousness. Let's go back to prayer before we go into the service today. Holy Father, I ask that you remove self from the pulpit. Let your words be heard. And we just thank you in advance for all these precious jewels of knowledge that you have poured out upon us, Holy Father. Blessed be thy name in the highest. Open our ears and our eyes. Let, let your words pour forth, Lord. Surround us with your holy angels. Let your Holy Spirit be here upon us right now, even right now, Lord. In every home, every viewer, every viewer in the future that comes and views this video, touch their hearts, convict their souls, Lead us all in these paths that you want us to travel and reveal your holy, beautiful, pure words of truth to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I guess we'll maybe if the PowerPoint's working, we'll have two songs at the end today. We'll try to go back to that in a little while. So, over the past several weeks, we've been covering under grace and each time we cover under grace we've talked about multiple things and we've talked about the law of god we talked about god's character we if you've missed any of this i want to recommend right now that after service today you go back and catch it uh, these are beautiful truths and it paints a beautiful picture in our minds and helps us to understand all these grand narr uh, the grand narrative and all of these uh uh, micro narratives all these uh, smaller lessons that are within the Bible's teachings for our edification uh, I have pre been presenting a challenge before a church some of you may have gone on and read it and studied it and some of you may not have but we're going to continue to work with that challenge as we discover the law of the, the different uh, aspects of the law of God's character as we have studied, which endures forever and never perishes, can never be done away with, is not nailed to the cross. And I've made that abundantly clear that I am a Sabbath-keeping, Bible-believing, non-Trinitarian Christian. So I do believe in God's commandments. They are not nailed to the cross. I've made that abundantly clear as I have presented these lessons under grace. Well, today's title is the righteousness of God. Did you know there is a righteousness of the law and there is a righteousness of God? Well, if it is of something, it belongs to. So I'm going to rephrase the righteousness of the law. It is kind of similar to this. Uh, let me explain it a different way. Uh, if you love one another, you have fulfilled the law. What does that mean? What does that mean to us? Is the law done away with in love? Is it canceled out? Is it abolished? No. God forbid. We have studied repeated, repeatedly these lessons, and we have come to learn that God's word endures for how long? Forever. God's character is forever. You cannot abolish it. It was never against us. We cannot do away with it. Nor does Jesus try to abolish his own father's revealed character of love to us. What do I mean by that revealed character of love to us? Those commandments is God's very character revealed to us. So as we draw closer to a holy, beautiful God. Our sins become greater and more grievous. And how is that possible? It's because the law is the strength of sin, as we have discovered and learned. The law reveals the strength of that sin within us. The sin wells up and we die because of sin. So the law is not the minister of death. 
It does not slay us. The sin within us, by the law, as we have discovered, slays us. The sin within you and I, by the law, slays us. So if I look at something that is of, love is of the law, not the law of love. In saying that, if you fulfill love, you are fulfilling the law because the law is the description of perfect love. And we're going to read some of that today in the scriptures. <coughs> so I know that's a lot to be covered, and I just spoke a lot. But let's back up and, and just ease back into this now. So I presented the challenge in Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. I know many of you are anxious to go back there. So at this time, right now, I want to go back to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. In your Bibles. <clears throat> and we've been covering this pretty, pretty regular, but now... I want to pick it up again at verse 12 and go back through to 16. And then we're going to cover this again a little bit today. Buried with him in baptism. Now, you remember, as we studied, we went back to Exodus. We went through Exodus 11 to 16, I believe, on deliverance and the law and what came. All right, for a quick recap. Which came first? Deliverance always came first. All throughout the Old Testament. And Paul articulates this design perfectly in the book of Romans between chapter 1 and chapter 9. Where it goes into, uh, 9 and 10 goes into the righteousness of the law and the righteousness which is of God. But what we have discovered is throughout the Old Testament, deliverance always came first. He delivered the Israelites. He delivered the Israelites with the blood over the lentils. He brought them out of Egypt. He baptized them. He baptized them in the crossing of the Red Sea. He brings them up into the wilderness of sin. You can look these things up, which is the wilderness. And what was the very first thing God reveals to them? The law? No. He had, already, he had already delivered his people. He had already covered them with the blood of the slain lamb. He baptized them in the spirit of adoption, placing his son's spirit into their hearts, metaphorically speaking. And then he reveals what was the very next thing he reintroduces uh, them to as his people. He reintroduces them to not the entire Decalogue or the commandments, but to the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the very next thing that God reveals to his people. And what he reveals to them is six days shalt thou work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath unto the Lord thy God. What he told the Israelites, these six days you shall gather the bread of heaven. You shall gather the bread of heaven. But on the sixth day is the only day of the week that you're going to gab, gather a double portion because I do not want you working on my holy day, the Sabbath. He said, on the sixth day, you will gather a double portion that, so that on the seventh day, you would have food in your houses and it would not rot nor stink or grow worms. Any other day of the week, if the Israelites gathered more than their portion and tried to store it overnight, it would rot, stink, and gather worms, or maggots, I would suppose. And, and it's proven. God told them not to do it. Some of them done it. It did just what he said it would do. But on the sixth day, he instructed them to gather extra, and it did not rot nor stink or gather worms. So... What we learn is God introduces them to the day of rest before they even make it to the schoolmaster, which was the law of his character or his very revealing. It, at Sinai, God revealed himself to his people. And when he reveals himself, he reveals himself through the law. The law was a law of love. It is the description of perfect love. If you go through that law and you look at it, 
the first four commandments is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The first commandment, I am the Lord thy God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before thee. It is one of, of the uh, heart. He wants our heart. And he tells us he wants us to love him. So the first four commandments is our relationship with the Father. So, and I'm going kind of fast, but it's okay. This is recorded. And we can go back and look at it again. So the very first commandment deals with the heart. The second commandment deals with your souls. He says in the second commandment, Thou shalt not make unto thee any uh, graven images of any likeness of anything of the heavens the earth, nor the sea, or, or any of those things. He says, for he is a jealous God, and I'm paraphrasing, and you can find all of this in Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, where the Ten Commandments are listed. So the second commandment is, I am the Lord thy God. The first one, I am the Lord thy God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Second one, thou shalt not make unto thee uh, any uh, graven images. As a matter of fact, let's turn there. I want to point something out to you now that I'm talking about the second one. But it deals with your souls. You are living souls, by the way. Mark this place in Colossians. We're going to come back to it. Go with me now to Exodus chapter 20. So, <clears throat> and then heart, soul, mind. The third one, thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. For he will not hold him guiltless who taketh his name in vain. The third one deals with the intellect. The intellect. What does it mean to take God's name in vain? And then the fourth commandment that deals with our loving relationship between us and a holy God is all about his Sabbath. He says, I have, I have set this day up in time. It's a memorial where you're going to gather in this platform of time so that you can honor me as your God and I will recognize you as my people. And then the remaining six of those Ten Commandments deal with your relationship to humanity, your brothers and sisters. Uh, the fifth commandment is about the marriage and the home. Thou shalt not commit adultery. God ordained two things in the Garden of Eden, and he puts them side by side in the center of his Decalogue, the fourth commandment and the fifth commandment. It is the Sabbath, Holy Sabbath, which is ordained from the Garden of Eden, and he reintroduces his people in the wilderness to that ordination, what he ordained. And then the second thing he ordained in the Garden of Eden, which the enemy is trying to destroy today, is the marriage. The marriage. So that's the fifth commandment. And then 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 deal with your relationship with humanity. And it's all about love. Love your brothers and sisters. If you love them, you will not break those things. So when we do works, we're not doing works to be saved. We're doing works because we are saved. There's a huge difference. And we're learning all this and unpacking it through history. Uh, and also in the first century when Paul wrote these things. In the first century of our uh, Christian uh, Christianity. So now, if we go to Exodus, I want to back up here because I want to point out the second commandment. So Exodus uh, chapter 20, <coughs> chapter 20, and I want to go to <clears throat> verse 3. Thou shalt have no other God, I'm sorry, verse uh, 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. This is relevant. And how this is relevant, we're going to be unpacking this today a little bit in Romans chapter 9 and 10. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the third, upon the children, unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. My goodness. Who can possibly hate God? Well, 
Let's see what God says about who hates him. Verse 6, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So now we have a contrast about to take place here. In this second commandment, those who love God, what do they do? They keep his commandments. Those who don't love God, let's find out who doesn't love God. Who is those that don't love God? Thou shalt not take... Uh, those who do not love God are those who are committing iniquity. Those who are committing iniquity do not love God. Verse 5, Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting thee what? Alright, so what is this big word iniquity? It's in contrast to those who love God. Iniquity is a lawless, law-breaking unloving people iniquity is the the bible's only definition for sin which you'll find in first john chapter 3 verse 7 i think i'd have to go there but it is the breaking of the commandments it's the breaking of the law now keep this in mind that law cannot make you righteous you and i are under a fallen nature adam's sin we're all under the sinful nature of humanity we cannot fulfill the needs of that law, period. No matter how hard we try, we're going to break those commandments. Here's the difference. Are you seeking to please God? Are you seeking to please Jesus? If you are, you will be a commandment-keeping people. So many people today want to throw those away. That is nailed to the cross. And both sides of the house want to nail as many of God's loving commandments to the cross as possible. You got Sabbatarians and you got Sunday worshipers. And they all want to nail something to the cross that was never meant to be nailed. And that's what we're unpacking. We want the pure truth of God. We want the pure truth. We don't want to do what is never been ordained to do, and that's to abolish God's word or his holy character, which is his commandments, as we have discovered over the past several weeks. Uh, so those who hate God I ask a question who hates God when Jesus comes and those ten uh, wise virgins or I'm sorry when the ten virgins arose some were wise some were foolish how many entered in how many got left behind those who left behind are knocking at the door Lord Lord let us in and what is Jesus going to say to those uh, unwise virgins who did not keep their lamps trimmed with the oil of love? You've heard me repeat this over the past. The oil of grace, the oil of love, agape, God's very character, commandment keeping people with the testimony of Jesus Christ. They don't have the oil of grace in their vessels. The love of many grew cold in the last days because lawlessness abounded. All these things are in the Bible. Lawlessness abounded. So the love of many will grow cold. Those churches love die out. And Jesus is going to tell them, I do not know you, you who worked iniquity, you who worked lawlessness, you who kept continuously teaching the breaking of my law and my father's law. I did not know you who willfully broke the commandments that I came to fulfill, the righteousness of God in me through belief, which is the minister, Christ is the minister of circumcision. I said deliverance came first and then Sinai, which was the schoolmaster to teach us our need for a savior, the loving character of God. I know this is very in-depth. But I had to just plainly speak the truth this day. So those who work iniquity are those who hate God. So many people today are saying those commandments are nailed to the cross. That seventh day Sabbath is nailed to the cross. Many, many people. And they'll go right to Colossians chapter 2 and tell you Sabbatarians that Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week is nailed to the cross. When I speak of the Sabbath, I am not referring to a a spurious day of worship that people want to label as the Sabbath, which is the first day of the week, which is bogus. 
It's a usurp of God's holy commandment day in the Bible. The first day of the week is only mentioned seven times in the entire Bible, and not one single time did God ordain the first day of the week to be a day of worship. As a matter of fact, it's quite contrary. Almost 60 times in the New Testament, God says the Sabbath is the day of worship, or it refers to the Sabbath almost 60 times in the New Testament. Not one time does it ever say, I changed my day of worship. If you ever see a false prophet walking on the earth saying that he represents God in the flesh and that God has changed his day of worship, don't follow. Because it's contrary to the Bible. And there's hundreds of times in the Old Testament that God says, when we gather together and worship him, by the way, the reason why I'm pointing this out, as the fourth commandment, you have the first, the second, he's a jealous God, he loves you. Lawlessness is the very second thing he mentions. Law and lawlessness, the two in contrast. Then he talks about your intellectual ability. Uh, love the Lord thy God with thy heart, all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. First commandment is the heart. Second commandment deals with our souls. And the soul is all about who it is that you worship. And the second commandment is pointing that out. The third commandment is the intellect. God says, come and let us reason together. Don't take my name in vain. Uh, it's not simply just speaking words. To take God's name as vain as those seven false churches, those seven virgins that take hold of one man, claiming the name thereof, but denying the power of it. And they don't want the power. They don't want the Holy Spirit. They don't want the power of God, which is the gospel of Christ, which is the spirit of grace, the spirit of truth, the spirit of adoption, the spirit of life, the spirit of glory, the spirit of supplication, and the spirit of holiness. The, sec the number of seven, which is the number of perfection, which represents Christ's spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, which you read about in Revelation chapter 3. Behold, I stand at your door and knock, Laodicea. If you open and let me in, I will come in and make a sup with you. Please notice that they have lost sight of the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on past the third commandment of taking God's name in vain, which is simply this, to deny the power thereof, is to take on the name, take on the name of Christ as a Christian, but deny everything in the Bible. I want to be called a Christian. I want to live and make you think that I'm a Christian. That's what people are doing, but they don't want the power. They don't want the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. I'm going to speak the truth. Even if it hurts. And it's going to hurt. Because Christ said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. So many of us are suffering in our families today. Why is that? I'll tell you why. The truth will set you free. And as you share that truth with others, it's going to divide asunder. Bone, uh, bone and marrow, spirit and soul. It is the sword of truth, and it cuts, and it cuts deep. But only Christ looks right into the soul, and he knows all things that happen. So many times I see people with all their Christian prefer, uh, paraphernalia everywhere, but then their actions prove something different. Just this week, a young man went to a scrapyard. He sold the scrap at the scrapyard. They cheated him out of $126, and they have Christian paraphernalia uh, there are Christian uh, ornaments everywhere, everywhere. But I actually read through everything and saw that they represented themselves as being belonging to Christ and at the same time lying and stealing. I'm going to tell you, they got past him. I looked at it and he recognized it later and he brought it back and he said, look what they did. And I looked over and said, you're right. They lied to you and they stole from you. Breaks my heart to see these things happening around us. But they take on the name and they deny the power thereof. They don't walk in the spirit they've been made alive by. That's too difficult for most people. They don't want that. They want an easy life. But I'm here to tell you right now, right here today, the way into the gates of heaven is narrow and straight and there be few that find it. Why are there only a few that find it? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because there's only a few looking for it. It's not because God predestined only a couple of people to get to heaven. 
God opened up the entire plan of salvation to the whole world through his general revelation. And it's up to you and I to either develop our characters to fit us for heaven or to develop our characters to hear these words. Depart from me. Which character will you develop? Which character will we develop? God has given that into your hands because he has made you and I free moral agents to choose this day whom it is you will worship. Brothers and sisters, that is the Elijah message. Eliyahu. Who will we worship? That's what all this is about. This is what Paul is teaching in the book of Romans. That's what the Old Testament pointed to. It's consecutive, consecutively articulated very beautifully. <coughs> and it's up to us to choose who it is we will worship. Who will we worship? Eliyahu. My God is Yahuwah. I worship the only true God. Hear, O Israel, I am the Lord thy God. I am Yahuwah thy Elohim. Whose name is printed in our foreheads? Will it be mystery as the harlot's name? In the book of uh, Revelation, chapter 17, verse 5, we see the name of the harlot, and the name of the harlot, their God is a mystery. Yes, I'm not saying we know everything about God, but let's just look at the plain truth in the Bible as it's written. If you want to serve a God that's unknowable, who, don't, who, do, who the church says is beyond your comprehension, serve that God. But for, as for me and my house, I'm going to serve a God that says, come, let us reason together. I want to reveal myself to you. I want a relationship with you. I love you, child, and all I want is your love in return. What is wrong with the churches? That's too hard for them, I guess. That's too hard for these churches today. To love God in the way he said, this is how you're going to represent that love to me. Keep my commandments. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 14. Revelation chapter 14 verse 18, I believe. But you'll find it in those two chapters. 12 and 14, you're going to find that God's true church on earth, written 90 years <coughs> or 100 years in the first century by John himself. And this is the words he says, paraphrasing both verses. They will be a commandment-keeping people who had the testimony of Jesus Christ. Jesus was crucified in 34 AD, 33, 34 AD. John writes this in 90 to 100 AD. 90 to 100 AD. 90 years later. They will be a commandment-keeping people with testimony of Jesus Christ. And this was passed on through the fathers of old, through the prophets of old, and the church stomped out and usurped that truth with their own holidays, holy days, with their own commandments. And the whole world today is following after that beast. I know I left, but I wanted to point out this character of love. It's important that we have the right concept of what that character of love represents. And what that represents. <coughs> so with that being said. Turn back with me now to Colossians chapter 2. Buried with him. Verse 12. Buried with him in baptism. We read about that in Romans chapter 6. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Through the faith of the operation of God. That is a very important uh, phrase there. That's very significant to us because that represents the righteousness of God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. That is what the Bible calls in I think chapter 10 and 9 of Romans the end of the law which we're going to cover too. The end of the law means that you have found the path. You have found the direction, the righteousness of God, which is in Jesus Christ, who is the minister of circumcision, which was given to Abraham before those holy commandments were, 
for our deliverance that we might be saved through faith by grace. Through faith by grace. Then the commandments came. God reveals himself so that we can enter into the paths of righteousness unto holiness. Are you a people of God? 2 Corinthians 6 and 7. Come out from among them, my people. Be you separated. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my children. How many of y'all want to be the children of God? Will you take counsel with his word and believe what he is teaching and saying right here? You want to enter into heaven? Learn about God. Learn about his ways. Learn his ways. As a matter of fact, John even tells us, <coughs> walk as he walked. See, the only measuring stick for a righteous life is not your fellow brothers and sisters. It's not Pastor Houston. It's not some other pastor. It's not some priest. It's Jesus Christ. That is our measuring stick. We should measure up. When he looks at us, is he looking at his children? Are we walking and living as he did? Are we seeking and striving to be as he was? Do we have his fruits? His fruits, you branches in that mighty vine. Do you have his fruits? What are his fruits? That should be your next question. What are his fruits? I'm asking, do you have them? Well, Houston, what are his fruits? Okay, I'll tell you what they are. Here they are. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. I don't recall a single time our Lord fought a physical battle and injured anybody. Now, if you have his fruits, they're fruits above all, above all, at the very top of that list is love. Christ says, you want to be perfect? Love your enemy. Love. At the very top. But here are the fruits from the top down. From the top down is how the word of God gives it to us. From the holiest, from the holy of holies, to the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit. Love, joy, peace. There's the holy place. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. You had the most holy. Love, joy, and peace. Most holy. Love, joy, and peace. Three compartments. Sanctuary message. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. The three stations in the holy place. The holy place. Then you have the outer courtyard. Faith. Meekness. Temperance. Temperance is the gate, is the entrance. He, God wants us to cooperate with him. The poor in spirit. Temperance. Do we have temperance? Do we follow his word? Do we find life in it? Temperance is self-control. Temperance is self-control. What did I say that Paul said in Romans chapter 9 and 10 that Christ was the minister of? This is an introductory to 8, 9, and 10. Christ is the minister of circumcision. Now, what are we to circumcise? The hearts. God says you cut away those sinful practices that you are living and allow me to come and, and cooperate with you and I'm going to walk you through the sanctuary which is thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. I'm going to walk you through the paths of righteousness unto holiness. I'm going to lead you and show you how to be fruit producing branches. I'll tell you this, if you're not producing fruit, God is going to prune you out. Just like he did most of Israel. But rest assured, if he's a God who can prune you out, he's also a God who can turn right around and graft you right back in if you will believe the minister of circumcision. If you will believe. But because of their unbelief, they were cut and pruned out. Out of what? Out of Christ. That's what they're pruned out of. 
But God says he is a God who can graft you back in. Who will you serve? Who will we believe? <clears throat> Let's go back to Colossians chapter 2. Buried with him in baptism, that old self, that body of flesh, the body of lustful flesh, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, has to die. And you have to resurrect a spiritual being. In other words, you resurrect in Christ. <coughs> <coughs> <clears throat> buried with him in baptism wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God through faith by grace who hath raised him from the dead Jesus laid down his life that he might take it up again. How did he take it up again? Because God called him forth from that tomb. God, who is the father of Jesus, called his son forth from that tomb. And he came out walking as a mighty conqueror on our behalf. Who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh... How many of us are willing to cut away those simple things? You know, those simple little things. I'm going to tell you this. If you're not willing to do a work within yourself, God cannot work and dwell within you. you got to submit the will. You have to submit the will. And when you have no strength to carry on and to do those things that you're incapable of conquering and overcoming, Christ says, I'll take it from here. I will take. My child, you did you did good. I remember a time when I used to chew tobacco. I chewed tobacco from grammar school all the way up into my 40s. I was 40 years old. And the Lord spoke to me one time. And he says, you have put a God before me. You have put a God before me. What did I say this, the first commandment was? The very first commandment. That I am the Lord thy God who brought thee out of the land of darkness. The Bible says Egypt. Out of the land of darkness for you and I. You shall have no other gods before me. He says circumcise your heart. Learn some temperance. You are grafted into my dear son. I want you to learn temperance. And start controlling your appetites. You know those are the eyes and of the flesh. And that pride of life. That some people can't shake off. Because they don't know how to be humble and meek. And follow the ways of the Lord. He says learn temperance. Cut those things out of your life. Cut them out. He says and I will come to you my people. And be your God. When you start working in yourself. Jesus that mighty conqueror is going to stand beside you. And he's going to lay a hand on your shoulder. And he's going to say well done my child. Let's continue forward. I want to take you all the way to the Holy of Holies and seal you in your forehead with my Father's name. And your reward will be great in the kingdom of heaven. I'm paraphrasing from all over the Bible. You want to know the truth? This is the absolute truth. He says, I will walk with you. And he lays that mighty arm and that mighty hand upon your shoulder as you begin to cut away those things that God said, do away with it, do away with it, do away with it. And when you get down to that one thing you can't do, let me tell you what the one God was that I had before my God when I was 40 years old. And the Lord spoke to me and said, Houston, you have a God before me. I said, what have I put before you, Lord? And I couldn't, I couldn't understand. He did not tell me. I didn't understand it. And I wrestled with it. And I talked to the Lord continuously. Lord, what is it that I have placed before thee? O oh, Father in heaven, what have I put before thee? And it began to prick my conscience and weigh heavily on me. And I was thinking on it and contemplating about this very thing. And one evening I got up and I, I started going for the shower, and I start thumping and packing that can of tobacco. Packing it down with my finger. 
and to get me a big old chew out of it. And I reached in and I flipped that can lid open and I got me a big chew and I stuck it in my lip and I flipped the can top back and the Lord had already been working on my conscience. And as I was going from my mouth, I was looking at that pretty silver lid thinking about how much I enjoy this tobacco. <sighs> And I almost got it up here and I realized the Lord said, this is it. I went, oh, oh, and my knees got weak and I felt weak all over and I began to tremble because I realized that this tobacco had me and I couldn't do it. I could, and I admitted it. I put it back in the can. And I put the lid down on it tight. I had been dipping from the time I was in my early teens all the way to 40 years old. Copenhagen. And I cried out to the Lord at that very moment, feeling weak and trembly and upset because this is what God had said that I had put before him. And I said, Lord, Lord, I said, I can't do it. And I began to confess my sin. Lord, I cannot do it. Temperance. It was the beginning of my Christian walk. And I went to prayer and I told the Lord, I said, I have no strength in me. I cannot conquer this. I cannot do it, Lord. And then I submitted my will to his. I submitted my will when I was finally met with something. I had a tremendous love for God. And I was willing to do anything except give up my tobacco. I said, Lord, I can't do it. I said, please, Lord, remove it from me. Take it away from me. Lord, there is no strength in me. I said, I can't do this. I said, take all desire away from me, Lord. Please, I give it over to you. And then I made the first step in the circumcision of my heart so that God could cooperate with me. I left that shower room. <clears throat> and I walked through the house. And I looked at the garbage can and I raised the lid up and I said, Lord, I turn it over to you at this moment. I said, remove all desire from me, Lord. It would be only in your strength that I can conquer this thing because I simply cannot do it on my own. But I give it up right here, right now, today. And I threw that dip back in that can and I threw that whole can in the garbage can. And I lowered the lid, and I said, I turn it over to you, Lord. I made the first steps that very evening. And I went, and I took my shower. I went, and I lay down and got in bed. The next morning, I rose up. All desire was gone. I have not had a desire for that tobacco since that day. God took it all, all the, you know, my mouth used to water just thinking about it. And my body would love the, the nicotine that it would feed it. But the very next morning I woke up, I had not yet realized it. But I would learn it in about a week. That I had zero desire within my mind and the members of my flesh for that idol. God said, this is where Jesus walks in. And he laid that mighty hand on my shoulder. Because I took the first steps and temperance, the fruits of my Lord, walking in his spirit. He laid that mighty hand upon my shoulder, and he says, I'll take it from here, my child. I will take it from here. How many of y'all are willing to do that? How many of us can give it to Jesus, really and truthfully? If you are, you will cooperate with him, and he will take it, and he will walk with you. And he will lead you every step of the way. He'll bring you into deeper drafts of the word. Deeper truths. Deeper knowledges. Deeper into the spirit. He gives you his spirit. Right into your heart.
to love what he loves, to hate what he hates, and to be able to cry out to the sovereign of the universe, the creator of every creature that exists out there that our science cannot know about. He allows us, Jesus allows us to cry out to him, Father. Jesus married you and I as a bride. He took on our flesh. He took on our flesh. And he says, I have married you. I'm going to wear humanity along with my divinity for the rest of eternity. With you by my side, child. With you by my side, child. I have married you. I'm going to be beside you for the rest of eternity. And you're going to represent me before the universe as my bride and my children and my priest. With this beautiful deliverance that I have given you called salvation. Righteousness through faith by grace. He is the minister of circumcision. The minister of circumcision is the spirit of grace and he brings you right to the entry of the sanctuary. He says, let's go for a walk. Where are we at today? Let's gauge ourselves by that spirit. I said temperance is the very bottom one. Then you have meekness. 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 Temperance deals with your flesh and the lust of your eyes. And then he starts working on that pride. He said, let's get rid of that pride, child. Let me tell you what I did. And this is what Jesus, let me take you on the journey. I'm going to tell you a story, Philippians chapter 2. I was the prince of the universe, Jesus says. I was the king of kings, and I was the, the king of glory. I received worship by mighty holy angels as being one equal with my father. And for you, my child, after you fell in your father Adam, I came here. I came here. To receive you to myself. And the way I had to come here. Is I had to shed. All of that. Royalty. And I had to humble myself. And become the servant. Of a servant on this planet. By condescending to this earth. And being born of a child. In your sinful flesh. I have opened up the doors. And now my child I want you to understand. I had to die. I'm asking you to die to those sinful ways. I'm asking you to put away those lusts. I'm asking you to form temperance. He is the minister. He is the minister of circumcision. And he's going to take us for a walk. He's going to take my hand. Oh, I love that song. Take my hand. I love that. Where we walk with Christ. He takes you by the hand. And he walks you through that sanctuary. Let's go back to our reading. I'm not going to cover the things I want to cover today. But the Lord has put all this other on my heart to share with you. As introduced in Romans chapter 8, 9, and 10. This week you study those chapters. But let's go back to our reading. Verse 13. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13. And you being dead in your what? Y'all not reading or are you reading? I can't hear you. You being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You're dead to the uncircumcision, meaning you've learned temperance and you're beginning to circumcise that heart. Get rid of those cherished idols. I said cherished idols. Start making the steps to get rid of them now. Invite Christ to come in and begin to walk with us. Walk with us, you and I. <coughs> hath he, God, this he here should be capital, it's God. Hath he quickened together with him, Jesus. We're quickened, made alive with Jesus. Having forgiven you all trespasses. He's forgiven us all those trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Handwriting of ordinances is dogma. Dogma in the Greek. Dogma is civil, uh, ceremonial, 
in ecclesiastical laws. If you look it up, this word dogma in the Greek has not changed in all the centuries. It's the same yesterday as it is today. Dogma is still the same word. It means the same thing. Civil laws, ceremonial laws, church laws. Civil laws, ceremonial laws, church laws. And I'm not referring to the law of God. I'm referring to those laws that were contrary to you and I that the Pharisees had made. You know, all hundred, I think it was nine, 900 extra laws. It was ridiculous. They had made all these extra laws, taste not, touch not, handle not, do not, this, 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 that was outside of God's law, outside of the handwritten law of Moses. It was even extended further by the priests. So now you have civil ceremonial where type meets anti-type you know the priestly rites and duties of the ceremonial with the ceremonial and also the ecclesiastical the priestly laws the pharisee laws the pharisaical laws that's what dogma is that's what it represents but i'm going to prove these things in the context so don't get nervous stay with me if you read it according to its context, it's going to make a lot of sense. It's all going to come together, and you're going to understand it clearer than you ever have, ever have, when you read it in its entirety. And we're going to keep covering this until we get it. In verse 13, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he made a lie together with Jesus, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwritten of dogma, dogma, that was against us. And I'm going to tell you this. God's law was never against you. God's law was never against you and I. It was always for us. Now, where, uh, where the ceremonial is the type and Jesus is the antitype, where substance and shadow meet, none of that was against you and I. It was for our salvation. Blotting out the handwritten of ordinances, which was against us, which was contrary to us. Again, God's law has never been contrary to you. It's always been for you, for it is a direct reflection of his very loving character. Anyhow, uh, going back to this, uh, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled those high priests, and having spoiled those high priests, it says having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a he made a show of them openly, triumphing over it, triumphing over it. So he brought them to an open shame, an open shame. Does he bring God's law to an open shame? Does he bring the handwriting laws of ordinance to an open shame? Or is he bringing civil laws to an open shame? Maybe ecclesiastical laws made up by the high priest to an open shame. And he fulfills those ceremonial laws where substance meets shadow. That doesn't abolish it. It's the fulfillment of it. It's the mark of it. He meets it. It's the, you know, it's kind of like in Romans chapter 9 and 10, it says that Christ is the end of the law. He is the mark. He is the one that fulfilled. He is, now, I'm going to go back to that. Hold those thoughts. Well, I'll share it now. <coughs> righteousness of, righteousness of something. Of what? The end of the righteousness of the law. For us. In other words, it's the end of the works. End of the works. He says, I made a way. You can't fulfill it. I made a way. Here's the mark. Through faith by grace. I'm the minister of circumcision. And the Bible says that. And Paul actually says that in either Romans 9 or 10, as we discover. So it is discovered also that he is the end of those works for righteousness of the law. Not the end of the law, but the end in the way of righteousness of the law. That's why it's the righteousness of God. You see, some people will disagree. Some people might agree, but Jesus is not a lesser God than his father. To make Jesus a lesser God would be a, 
a terrible thing, terrible thing, because God himself exalted his son and makes him equal to himself. And whatever God says is absolute truth. And if you don't believe it, go to the word and discover it. It's there. But Jesus is the end of the righteousness of the works that you and I were trying to perform to be righteous. He's the end of that. So the schoolmaster leads you to the need of a Savior, and then once you're saved through faith by grace, which is the, the covenant that was given to Abraham, you become children of Abraham, you become the children of God, because that is the covenant, that is the minister ministration rather of circumcision, which Christ became the minister of to us. Beautiful stuff. In verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath. And that is the weekly Sabbath. Sabbath. And I've discovered, we discussed this. We talked about it almost 60 times. This word is in the Bible. And it's always the seventh day Sabbath. So if your uh, if your conception nails the seventh day to the cross, then you have a misconception. If Listen to me carefully. If your conception of what this passage is saying nails the seventh day Sabbath to the cross, then you have a misconception and you've taken it out of the context. And we're going to discuss that more next week, probably. Uh, next week, we're going to discuss more of keeping this, these few passages in the context of uh, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, the whole chapter. So when we have the right conception, then we understand it clearly. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body of Christ. But the body. And then you have the words, is of Christ, italicized, added text. It's not, is the body, uh, but the body is of Christ. Is of Christ was not in the original Greek. Uh, and they, they clearly state this by putting it in italicized form. When it's in italicized form, it was put there because that was their understanding at the time of the interpretation, and they were trying to make the words of God easier for your comprehension. But what makes more sense is let no one judge you in these things but the church. And that's what it's really saying. But the church. Judgment for those who are without is for God. Those who are within, we should always be fruit examiners. If someone takes on a name and denies the power thereof, you better be aware of what's happening. You need to be aware of what's happening. As a matter of fact, Paul condemns one church in the Bible and says, if you don't get that adulterous affair out of the church and do it right away where a son had taken on his father's wife and was sleeping with her and the whole church knew about it, he says, either you correct it or I'm going to take care of it and address it when I come. Get it out of the church. There is such a thing as corporate sin. And that's why it says, but the body, but the church, but the church. No man judging these things, but the church. And their judgment is always a righteous judgment because it's not opinionated. It's always according to the word of God. And there's much to be said about that. In verse 18, let no man beguile you, deceive you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, introducing into those things which he had not seen vainly puffed up in his own fleshly mind. Voluntary worship of angels. That is false worship, and those false angels, those fallen angels, desire your worship. They want to be worshiped, namely uh, Satan himself looks for your worship, and has indeed obtained much of the world's worship today as he hides behind churches and people, which is a real shame. And not holding the head, which is Christ, from which all the body and joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. We should always walk in the spirit, study the word, and seek those things as, that is righteousness unto holiness. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ, it goes back to how you open with the baptism of Christ. Therefore, if you be dead with, uh, dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world you are subject to ordinances? Here's that dogma again. So Paul goes on to explain even further what 
ordinance he was referring to, the handwritten law of ordinances, he's going to uh, talk about some more and exemplify right here. Um, and he even says it, uh, touch not, taste not, handle not, you know, wash your hands, do this, do that. It was the priestly laws that were added, just like I had said, and Paul explains it very carefully, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of who? So he, now he doesn't leave it for our imaginations. He tells us plainly these handwritten laws of ordinances were the doctrines of men. They were the doctrines of men. And Christ made an open show of those Pharisees and those priests and those churches by bringing them to an open shame at his cross. It makes sense to me. And Paul says it, he articulates it very well. And he lays it out. And it's not left for our imagination. He tells us clearly what he means. In verse 23, Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship. In will. Their will worship. They chose to submit the will to another. And humility and neglecting of the body not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. <clears throat> we also had to submit the will to another. We submit our wills to God. And that's what I was talking about earlier. God wants to cooperate with us, and that should be to the glory of God honoring the flesh. and I mean, honoring the spirit and not the flesh. We don't want to satisfy the things of the flesh, but we want to satisfy the things of the spirit. For God seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit and in truth. Learn of your Savior. Walk as he walked. Learn his ways and learn the word. Learn God's words. Partake of it. Eat of it. See. Taste. It is as sweet as honey. Sweet as honey. Now, next week when we gather again, we're going to go back to Romans chapter 8, 9, and 10. What I would like you to do is study Colossians chapter 2 further. Further study what I have shared with you today. But before we close, right now turn with me in your Bibles to Malachi chapter 4. It's the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4, the very last book of the Old Testament. Now, when the prophet, the priest Malachi, wrote this book, you can read the whole book. This was the last book written before Jesus came, before Jesus came to the earth. Now, I want you to keep in mind that these prophets wrote according to as they heard Jesus' voice. Jesus spoke to them. He told them what to write. Now, Malachi gives us an end-time prophecy for an end-time people, and he even paints the picture of the judgment scene. And he talks about the judgment scene, and he talks about where we are supposed to be as Christian in the very last days, the same as John writes about. But now this book was written 400 years before Jesus came. 400 years before Jesus came. And... Pay close attention to the words that Malachi writes here. In verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all them that do wickedly, shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. There's going to be a judgment scene. The wicked are going to be burned up in hell fire. In spite of what some people in the loving character of God movement may think. And I'm going to cover that according to Paul's articulations in Romans 9 and 10 next week. You know, God will be merciful to whom he will be merciful and gracious to whom he will be gracious. That's been part of this study. That's why we have examined all of this. It also points out a loving God who is also a just God, a just God, a just and loving God. <clears throat> and the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. The ones that do wickedly are the branches of the root, and the root is Satan himself. And any time any gardener burns a tree with its roots, trunks, and branches, you have the branches 
the leaves burn up very quickly. The branches burn up also very quickly. The limbs are a little bit longer. And then you have the trunk, which burns a lot longer, those evil masters. And then you have that stump and root. You know, the one that wanted your worship. In verse 2, But unto you that fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, they're because they're going to be ashes under your feet. For they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this. Is Malachi doing this? It's the Lord of hosts. It's the Lord doing this. It's the Lord. You know... It didn't say it's those enemy fallen angels doing it. That would make no sense. Those, those fallen angels are going to burn themselves up. No. The Lord is going to, and you know what? They all chose that path. It was according to their own free will as free moral agents. Even those fallen angels. They chose the path. They're going to reap what they sow. They don't like to hear that. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith who? Malachi? It's the Lord. The Lord's going to do this thing. Not Malachi. Not the fallen angels. You know, there's so many false teachings out there. This is our safety net. Study the Word of God. It's our safety net to teach us right from wrong, good and evil. All right, but now here, pick it up at verse 4. Remember you the law of Moses, my servant. Is Moses Malachi's servant or God's servant? And what is God instructing us to do? He just gave you the last scene of earth's history. He just told you, he just went right to the judgment scene, and he told us what was coming. And now he's going to tell us what to do to avoid that burning. He's going to tell us as an end time generation what we should be looking for, what we should be upholding, what we should be doing. Remember you, the law of Moses, my servant. If it's the law of Moses and he's the servant of God, whose law is it? It's God's law as well. Moses was simply a servant doing God's will. Which, now carry on, this is going to confirm. Here's your affirmation. Which I commanded. He did what? God commanded the law of Moses. God commanded it. Which I commanded it unto him in Horeb. We've been studying this. For all Israel. With what? With, does he leave anything out? With what? Statutes and judgments. It's perfectly in line with what I've been teaching. Remember, now let's keep going. Don't stop there. Don't get hung up. Let's keep going. Behold, and it's still an end time message. He gives you this instruction between an end time scene and an end time spirit or an end time what he's going to do. <coughs> it's all an end time message for the last generation of earth's history. Verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He talks about the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord and the burning of the fire. He tells us what to remember. Now, by the way, there's only one other time you see this in the Bible, and it's in front of the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day. Well, now, 400 years before Christ is born, is the very last message to Israel by the very last Old Testament prophet, Malachi. Behold, I will send you Eliyahu, the prophet, before. I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming and great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. That spirit of Elijah that's being sent that great spirit of Elijah is choose you this day whom it is you're going to worship. Eliyahu, my God is Yahuwah. Are you going to worship man? Are you going to worship man's doctrines and his creeds? That's the very thing Jesus brought to an open shame on the cross. 
The very thing he brought to an open shame. Church dogma. Church doctrines. Our only creed is this. Do you stand on it? Study Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to continue to cover this further. And if you nail the Sabbath day to the cross with the conception you hold, go back and read the last message to an end time people in Malachi and see if it adds up with your belief system as a Sabbatarian and also as a Sunday worshiper. See if it adds up to God's word. And if it doesn't, accept the truth and believe lest you be pruned out for your unbelief. For we are all held accountable for the knowledge that God has given us. I love you all. Happy Sabbath. Let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Holy Father, we come before your throne giving praise, thanks, honor, and glory unto you, Holy Father. Blessed be thy name in the highest. I ask that you continue to lead us, guide us, and direct us. Lord, if there's any of unbelief out there from the words they have heard today, Lord, I ask that you touch their heart and open their eyes. Remove the blinders. Let them see and hear and touch and feel. And let, them, let them know that you are the God of the universe, the God of the truth, Lord. And reveal these truths to all of us. And bring us into that closer relationship with thee. That's our desire, Lord. Our heart's desire is to be with you. Above all other things. We love you with all of our hearts, souls, minds, and strength. Keep us as your children for all eternity. In Yeshua's holy name we pray. Amen.